So welcome everybody to another Xscale webinar. Today we will be talking about the RAC Status Blue. Pete, what is that going to be? It is a very strange idea, isn't it? Uh, red, amber, and green is what everybody is used to. Um, now, what's just happened there? That's bizarre. Hang on. That's not what I wanted to do at all. Oh, I see what's happened. Sorry. Right. Okay. All good. Um, yeah. So. Red, amber, and green, and of course, most projects are watermelons, red on the inside and green on the outside. Uh, there are lots of formal definitions of what red, amber, and green are supposed to, to mean, but the basics are that red requires corrective action. And as we saw last time, uh, no one has any motivation to declare that their program or project has gone red which results in these beautiful, large, and unhealthy fruit. So the idea with blue is to make a program transparent, to be able to look inside and understand not just what the overall status is, but what contributions the program is making to the top line of the organization as a whole and where the bottlenecks are in the value streams that make up a program or a portfolio so that you can actually do something about it. Uh, whether that something is um, corrective action or whether it's simply uh, a matter of reprioritization uh, and, and an orderly and sensible thing uh, rather than some kind of crisis that you must hide under the rug. Well, uh, that comes down to how you expect your portfolio or your value stream to organize itself. Uh, most of the time, the fact that there are various kinds of fluctuations, these are all learning opportunities. It shouldn't be a matter of, is it red or is it green? Uh, there's a whole continuum of... Um, important information in understanding what's going on when you're trying to manage a portfolio that's hidden by RAG status. So the idea with blue is basically transparent. Does that make sense, Stefan? Yes, and it's a bit of a heretics thought, I believe. You know, mm -hmm. um, coming back to the old uh, Six Sigma, uh, Sigma mantra, failure is not an option. Mm -hmm. um, permanently talking about what's going wrong. You named it a learning opportunity, you may put significant stress on any organization that is still somewhat rooted mm -hmm. in this cost accounting project funding um, principle. I completely agree with you. If we have cost accounting as the basis for understanding progress, well, then we have uh, an enormous blind spot anyway so uh, if we're going to look at a program and think that it has responsibility for something other than maximizing utilization and minimizing OPEX, well, then we're suggesting that the management is on the hook for things that right now uh, they deem as out of their control. We have product managers and we have program managers. And they're not the same people. The product managers might be on the hook for whether you're going to get good business outcomes. But the program managers are not. Um, the trouble is that these things have something to do with each other. They don't just happen in isolation. And so the political tension between whether you call it product and portfolio, or whether you call it business and technical. However you, you uh, describe this um, siloing of responsibility, it's not a good thing. And so the idea with Blue is to manage by the numbers. And well, those numbers have to be something that takes into account more than just cost accounting. Um, so I propose in the rest of this little podcast to look at what kinds of numbers are important to understand the components of throughput and to understand what we should do about those things. 
What do you think, Sifa? That sounds like a good idea. So, gold rut throughput accounting, what is this all about? Well, uh, I think we have to begin with agile basics. Uh, I, I imagine that most of the people who are listening to us are very well aware that uh, component teams aren't a really good idea and uh, cross-functional feature delivery teams are a, are a good idea. And, uh, there's this very pretty Nyberg diagram. I actually don't think that the, the content of the diagram is original to him, but he's got such a knack for drawing things and making them look simple. I picked on this one. Um, so uh, on the top line, uh, we have uh, the construction of some kind of item of value, in this case a car, uh, by assembling uh, its components. And the trouble with doing things this way is, well, obviously we can't get value until we've assembled all the components, but more to the point, we can't quantify uh, the progress until we, we get to the end. So we have this enormous long dark period where all we can really say is whether we are on time and under budget for delivering various components, whether we've slipped or not. Where when we are delivering like the stuff below the line, where we start with a skateboard and then we've got a, a scooter and so on. Well, not only are we able to deliver some value, there's no question if, if the customers are expecting a car, they're not gonna be very happy with a skateboard. But with a skateboard, we can test our assumptions. We can test the riskiest assumptions that we've got, which are around lubricants and bearings. Um, and then by adding uh, an extra feature or two, by adding a steering column, we can start to, to to test the assumptions inherent in the steering geometry. Uh, when we add a, a drivetrain and a, a seat, we, we make a, a bicycle of the thing, uh, then we can start to test uh, things to do with gearing uh, and, um, and steering uh, in a way that has very little to do with body weight, it has more to do with a, a control mechanism. So as we go along, uh, we're able to reduce the risk inherent in delivery. And with component teams, we can't do that. So also, uh, what we're doing as we go along is um, we're validating not just the assumptions, but the expectations about market behaviors. So uh, that's a lovely idea about agile delivery. But when we are talking about program status, that's not the way that portfolio managers and PMOs think about things. Uh, there is a constant demand for, can you give us a Gantt chart to show us where we're up to? And we have uh, agile project managers or agile program managers who are trying to do some sort of translation between one and the other. There are obviously scaling frameworks where we don't bother to put together Gantt charts, but I, it, almost invariably, there is someone uh, higher up in the organization who is building one uh, and trying to guess at what the, the connection is between some kind of agile status reporting uh, and, and what they really care about, which is these weird Finnish start dependencies. And the red stuff here is the, the critical path. If we deliver our components in this way, then we'll be able to be on time and under budget. Uh, now, in, in the Agile world, we poo-poo Gantt charts. Uh, we think this is a, a silly way to go about this. And part of the reason we think it's silly is if we're trying to deliver features, then, well, you can construct a Gantt chart for feature delivery, but it has no finish start dependencies and, uh, because you can reprioritize. And if you have no finish start dependencies, you can always mock things out if you need to. Um, that doesn't mean you can deliver the features, but at least you can get things built and you can make certain you're accounting for the most effective way to bring those features to market. You can define a set of releases and you have a lot of flexibility to maximize value and learning that you don't have if you're delivering by components and if you're uh, doing things that are oriented to baselines, budgets, and uh, the, the kinds of big design up front that Agile was a reaction against. 
the, the, the Gantt chart doesn't give you a way to represent these things. Uh, it doesn't measure those things. And that means that we wind up with this uh, gap in expectations. Uh, I have seen a terribly large number of large organizations where um, uh, agile programs uh, report as green, not because they are uh, going along just fine, but because there's no way to represent what's actually going on with them in the context of traditional status reporting. So if if we are measuring the progress of these programs and portfolios in an illogical way, then the gold rep maxim will apply and we will wind up with terrible surprises. Um, and well, that doesn't make anybody very happy, but as long as everyone can wave the agile flag, uh, maybe that's not so bad. However, maybe there's a better way to do it. And that's kind of where this idea of a blue rag status comes from a transparent rag status. Now, that's not to say that Agile gets it right. And in fact, I would like to suggest that there are many ways in which Agile reporting is just as illogical, is just as much a vanity metric as, um, as its predecessor. Now, I, I don't know whether you're following along okay with this, Stefan. What do you think? Oh, I completely agree. Okay, so I, I think everybody's seen these burn down charts. They don't usually look like this. Um, it would be very nice if they did, because it would mean that uh, what we are expecting, uh, the, the diagonal line, the, the number of stories that we can deliver per uh, week or per day, but let's say we're talking about weeks because per day uh, is far too bumpy for it to make any sense. If we're talking about weeks and then this actually is, they have a bunch of interesting inflection points in these curves. That green curve, well, uh, I don't think there are very many agilists who have ever seen one of those for real. Uh, they, they're usually either the line is above or, sorry, the curve is either above or below the diagonal line. The diagonal line, if it's regarded as a commitment, becomes uh, an excuse for heroics. So if we look at this blue line, you can see um, uh, that someone has decided about um, four and a half weeks in that we are in trouble and maybe maybe someone actually dared raise the status to amber maybe they did not but we are in trouble we're not hitting our release commitments we're, we're very far from from this uh, black diagonal line so we must work harder we, we we must do some weekends and evenings and um so everyone sprints towards this uh diagonal line and that doesn't last very long. It looks like a couple of weeks is, is about, about what you'd expect before people's burnout turns into uh, various forms of uh, sick leave and churn and low productivity and rework and uh, all of the sorts of things that happen when you cut corners and, and uh, go as fast as you can. It's not a sustainable behavior. So then things flatten out for a little bit until maybe uh, and I'm reading a lot into this blue curve, well, maybe the manager goes, ah, I need more resource. I'm, I'm going to, uh, to get some more people onto this team. And, uh, or I'm going to get another, another squad involved, another scrum involved. Uh, and then, well, then Brooks Law kicks in, for those who don't know Brooks Law. Uh, it comes from a wonderful old book called The Mythical Man Month, um, which is a classic of project management from the 20th century. Um, uh, Brooks Law states that adding resource to a late project makes it later because of the overhead and bringing people up to speed and the communications overhead and all the stuff that we've talked about in the last couple of webinars. So you wind up with um, not a very pretty picture at, uh, when you get to this release point in the middle of week nine. Now, uh, we might have a curve that looks more like this purple curve where you have a team in a very similar situation, but instead of, um, of panicking and trying to work harder, they look for the bottleneck. Uh, they look for what is the constraint in delivery that's biting this. And it could be just uh, our team sizes are too big. It could be uh, we've got some upstream team that have responsibilities for doing things and they don't talk to us. It could be that uh, we have manual testing uh, going on and uh, we, we need to automate our testing because we have to be able to refactor as we go 
Uh, there's lots of things that might be the bottleneck, but the main thing is they take some time out to work on it. And after they've worked on it for a bit, then they're able to speed up. Maybe they don't really hit exactly the way it looks in this diagram, but they, they certainly have increased their velocity. And in Agile, we, we are not used to thinking of velocity as a vanity metric. I, I want to give some cause to think that way. Um, but we'll get to that. So, Stefan, what do you think so far? It's a nice burn down chart. <laughs> Velocity is not just uh, the, the the agile vanity metric equivalent to whatever on the Gantt side. So. Mm -hmm. It is more useful. I mean, knowing flow rates is is really useful. You can project them, so it gives you an ability to adjust expectations early. You don't have to sit there and go, "Oh, we've slipped this much, but we'll catch it up." Uh, we can say, "Oh, well, we're going to have to adjust expectations numerically." What the numbers are telling us is this, but. Um, I think the main problem with the Gantt chart is because it doesn't have that understanding of flow rates, it doesn't motivate changes in behavior that are sensible. Uh, the person who's managing the, the group on the blue curve may be crowing and laughing at the, the poor buggers on the purple curve right up until they hit that second inflection point. So uh, Gantt charts, by, by ignoring flow rates as well, they, they don't motivate us to change our behavior in a sensible way. They, 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 we keep behaving illogically. But what were you going to say, Stefan? Yeah, I would, would agree with you. Although sometimes the illogical behavior is actually quite rational. You know, if you mm -hmm. uh, look at it from a personal agenda perspective, you know, yeah. Blame goes up. <laughs> if if yeah. I'm clean, I can't be blamed. So I just stick with what I'm doing. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, without the kinds of uh, reward models we talked about in our last webinar, it might indeed be perfectly rational to, um, to work harder and to rack up technical debt. That might be the only way to get your bonus. So um, you, you're bang on in thinking that what is good for the outcome is not necessarily going to be good for the output. It's not necessarily going to get you what you uh, are, are, are measured uh, are against. It's not going to be good for your KPIs. True. So let's imagine for a moment that that's not the case, that, that actually what we're trying to do is proper agile. We, we really want to to land good outcomes. We want to delight our customers. So, Stefan, which of these two curves would be better if that's what we're valuing, the red or the green? My God, that's a question. Uh, I would stick with the red one. Because there the are red one? of learning. Okay. Okay. So, um, they certainly get to the same spot, but I would suggest that the red one is less lean than the green one. It's got there's less frequency of learning in the red one. Admittedly, yes, it's less smooth. You know, maybe it's not continuous learning, but they have some sort of batch learning, but probably you can turn that into some smoother form of learning at a later stage. Well, I guess what I'm suggesting is that those inflections, those steep inflections, that um, those are causes for inquiry. If the green curve is possible, then whatever's causing this dip in the red curve must be some form of waste in, in lean terms. Now, it might be an essential waste. It might be that we, we are dependent on the upstream team. There's nothing we can do until they deliver this component. We're not able to do any of our agile stuff. But it, it certainly is a cause for asking why that happened. Certainly. So in that sense, it represents a different form of learning. Huh? Mm. Yes. Um, so I guess what I'm suggesting is by looking at the numbers, we can start to question root causes. And for me, the, the other bump on this is, is worse because they, they sped up, they were going just fine, and then they couldn't keep it up. They actually wound up going horizontal at the end. And I want to know why. 
uh, if, if was it that everyone was somehow forced to to work the weekends and evenings and that was why or was it that there was some big bang integration point uh, and that was why or maybe there was a lot of experimentation and um, we needed that experimentation it was it was really important to us it wasn't overburdened per se it, it was that um, we uh, we we needed to slow down to be able to speed up. That would all be legit. But where we see a cycle of these things, where, where we have things wobbling from uh, below to above and back again, that kind of wobble, that's where I would question your original judgment. And I admit that uh, this is only a tiny little segment of these curves. It might not be sufficient basis to worry, but um, that... And, and, and also, we don't know what the causes are. If we can identify the causes, it might be that, again, there's no reason to worry. But the, the, the wobbliness of these burn-ups, um, to me, that's a bigger problem because it means that we, 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 we have some cycle of hurry up and wait going on. And that kind of thing usually generates technical debt. Um, now... I, I will admit that Mugo is not one of the official lean words. I needed a word for technical debt and that would go with the other lean words, and I couldn't find one. So uh, based on my extremely rudimentary Japanese, I made one up. Um, but if there are any Japanese speakers listening who, um, uh, who can think of a better word for this, particularly one that has a mu on the front, um, uh, please do get in touch with us. Anyway, the idea with this is that as we're wobbling around and thrashing around and cutting corners and delivering things quick and dirty and, 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 and getting ourselves fatigued and uh, making the kinds of uh, mistakes and causing the kinds of rework that come with fatigue, we wind up in a place where um, we have an embarrassing amount of problems, not just defects, but uh, design flaws or, or smells in our code base. Now, we've moved pretty far away with this concept. We've moved far away from the idea of business agility. We, we, we're, we're off in um, technical agile land. But this kind of debt can afflict organizations on the business side just as well. Uh, the fact that we don't measure what's going on there doesn't mean that it isn't happening. And the idea with this is that if we are doing some kind of uh, quarterly planning ritual where we, we go into a big room and we try to get people to commit to deliver a certain amount of stuff every sprint and we play games with story points and so on, I, I, I admit I am kind of picking a little bit on the big frameworks, but this is also a problem with the little ones. Um, we go and make some kinds of long-term plans and we try to make commitments and uh, all the technical guys in the room know that, gee, we've got some problems that we're not actually attending to. And the tragedy of the PMO that um, you and I discussed last week, Stefan, uh, well, that's what promotes this growth in technical debt. But the result of it is that our story points, well, it's very embarrassing to say we can only deliver uh, half or three quarters the story points that we did last release in this release. The fact is that might be the very healthiest thing to say. And a lot of agilists would encourage everyone to always commit to only 80% of the running average uh, because it gives us room to, to figure things out and to pay down debts and uh, to experiment, to, uh, to be able to take on more work to over uh, deliver and under promise. That sounds like a good thing to do. But um, unfortunately, a lot of the frameworks frown at that sort of thing and try to get people to commit to, um, uh, to deliver as much. And whether or not that commitment is realistic, um, we can still get, due to the tragedy of PMO, a situation where paying down technical debt is not something that we can afford to do in this release or next release or any release and we wind up generating legacy. We went into that in depth last time. Um, so this is a problem because 
we have two burn up charts that look the same or roughly the same we, if we if we inflate our story point estimates but they mean different things so that gets us to this um, gold rat idea again we we're not logical in what we're measuring do you buy it so far or we are indeed logical <clears throat> excuse me so but an exercise i always run with my teams is how to cook the agile books so situation is always as follows. Imagine a scenario mm -hmm. where your manager is totally focused on, on velocity, where velocity yeah. is the metric that uh, reflects the growing fluency of the team in agile practices. Mm -hmm. yeah. so how do you deal as a, as a, as a team with the manager? Mm -hmm. And I've never encountered a team who wasn't able to come up in less than 10 minutes with all the nice tools and tricks and whatever mm -hmm. you to, to actually game this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm gaming yeah. it for at least 12 months. You know, after mm -hmm. that, uh, you should probably look for a new employer or a new project, but <laughs> for that period, you're safe. You know? <laughs> oh, you used the word. <laughs> and, you know, there, there's so many tips and tricks you can, can apply to this. Um, yeah. I mean, overestimate, estimation inflation over time, or you... Yeah. You shop, uh, you shop stories in even smaller parts than originally intended to to increase the throughput and and all these these things. Uh, I, I had one product manager go red in the face and pound the desk with his shoe, or at least the next best thing, uh, uh, yelling about where's my three hundred story points? You declared I was going to get an extra three hundred. I want my three hundred story points. And when it was explained to him that well, story points wibble and wobble around. I mean, we're, we're just giving you forecasts of how difficult we things are going to be. We're not making a commitment. Um, he took off the other shoe and pounded the, the table with both of them. Um, it, it, was, um, it was a pretty scary meeting, to tell the truth. And um, the games that you're talking about, uh, they are so common on both sides of the business technical divide. Of course uh, they are. I mean, it's the same with the product manager on the other side. You know, this, this, uh, let's, let's not focus on technical debt. We can clean that up, that up at the latest mm -hmm. stage. Uh, ideally, once I delivered uh, my project in, in time and under budget and, and then move on to the next project and you deal with a legacy, you know? Yeah. Um, so a lot of moral hazard in, in, implied here. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, this is all illogical behavior. And, uh, I, I believe the reason for this is that we're not measuring uh, the stuff that actually matters to everybody. Uh, we, we looked last time at how we can um, open the books and have people share common top line based goals. But we haven't talked about how that turns up in numeric form. So I want to look at that a little bit and see whether we can learn some lessons from Lean to identify what throughput really means to us so that we could get people working from the same uh, metric basis. They, they could actually see eye to eye because they would, would care about the same numbers. Does that make sense? Yes, totally. Cool. Okay. So uh, Lean provides us with this useful tool called a cumulative flow diagram. And the idea is we, we get to look at the population of stories in certain states. Uh, if you go with the no estimates idea that all of the uh, uh, the differences in sizes of stories average out in the bell curve over time, then this makes some sense. And so uh, as we go along delivering our stories, they get into continuous integration uh, if we're doing things properly. In other words, we're writing tests and we expect those tests are going to be run every time we check in uh, in a continuous integration server. And eventually we're going to want to take all the stories that add up to some business valuable feature and we're going to want to do some integration testing in a production like environment and then we're going to want to take that feature and maybe a bunch of features out into the world into production and we will have feature toggles against them and we can do our system integration testing against alpha audiences beta audiences we can do all kinds of a b stuff uh, and that gives us a lot of very useful information we can take back into uh, our prioritization processes if we do things properly. We've talked about 3D Kanban in the past for that sort of thing. Well, 
Let me ask you this, Stefan. Which one of these beautiful curves in the cumulative flow diagram is throughput? My God, always these tests. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I can just, I, I can let you blow it off. I mean, I can just answer. Um, but I thought you might like to have a go. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm a really bit exhausted from my my caffeine. Oh, all right, uh, all right. I'll, I'll be calling call call the credit <laughs> method. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, the, the, basically, what I'm suggesting is that none of these are throughput. Uh, uh, you know, people get very excited, but we must have this stuff in in production. But we're missing uh, a lot of um, what contributes to to throughput in a gold rat sense. And we're going to have to look at what gold rat said about throughput to really understand. Uh, things that we are missing in our measurements. So for a start, uh, well, delivering these stories is soaking up some amount of operating expense, uh, which maybe we started with a, a big pot of money, an investment of some sort, or maybe the operating expense is being funded by the existing value stream. In any case, we're definitely soaking some of this up by paying people to go around delivering things. But that's not the only place that we're soaking this stuff up. Uh, we, we also have people who are uh, taking our business drivers and constraints and boiling them down into specs or epics or um, uh, whatever you think of as the big chunks. And um, I'm going to call them features generically. And the work of doing that analysis, uh, well, Someone has to be paid to do that. And it's not usually the, the delivery squads. It might be a bunch of people doing design thinking or lean UX or UXD or uh, lean start, all kinds of things they could be doing in another room. If, if we do things properly, then actually we have the same people who are doing the delivery work cycling through this experimental uh, capability. And um, uh, we, we have, ways of dealing with that. I'm trying to remember whether we've actually shown the Camelot diagram in anything we've done so far. I guess we did Game Without Thrones, so we must have. Um, so um, in any case, uh, we don't need to go back there. The point is that people are breaking these things out and then we have to figure out what are the acceptance criteria. And if we do that acceptance criteria work properly, then uh, in an agile mode, we're, we're doing it in BDD. We have automated tests that are going to run against the delivered features. And then we've got all the rest of delivery. But um, according to Goldrat, we still don't have throughput on this diagram. Um, because in Goldrat's, uh, Goldrat, to, be, to revisit it in case no one knows who that guy was, because you might go, oh, well, he's not Schwaber and uh, Sutherland, he's not Beck or Jeffries, he's not any of the manifesto signatories. Who's that guy Pete's talking about? This is the guy who invented theory of constraints, amongst other things. And uh, if you are familiar with anything in DevOps, then you're familiar with the Gene Kim book, The Phoenix Project, which is based entirely on Goldratt's book, The Goal. So Goldratt's one of those um, unsung forces in agile, especially business agility. Uh, and if you don't know his work, then you are missing a very important uh, piece of the puzzle. So Goldratt said that we have to understand the relationship between return and operating expense to be able to describe throughput. But the trouble is, in cost accounting, we have a fallacy. And the fallacy is that uh, there is some fixed cost per unit of revenue, that the relationship between these things is a, a constant. And it doesn't take too much thought, uh, too much looking at Google Analytics, and Facebook Analytics, and so on, to realize that that's not true. That um, there, this is a variable relationship. And Kent Beck has talked about this relationship as a sigmoid curve. He has a, a beautiful um, body of work he calls 3X, uh, where the idea is at the start of the sigmoid curve, you're, you're exploring, then you go about, uh, uh, I forget his X's, damn it. Anyway, you go about um, delivering and then you wind up, I think expanding is what he calls that, and then you wind up with diminishing returns and I don't know if he says it's exploiting or there's another X. Anyway, 
Um, you can go and read. If you Google Kent Beck 3X, you'll find that stuff. But, um, but I think he's kind of missed the most important parts of this because if we're going to understand the relationship between operating expense and return, then we have to understand the components of return. And that's where the pirate metrics come in. Now, uh, we've, we've touched on these in the past uh, when we, we looked at the pirate canvas. Uh, the, the acronym, the reason we keep saying pirate, the acronym is R, uh, which stands for acquisition, activation, retention, referral. And in the original embodiment, revenue, we like to say return because for some activities, it might be that the return is not revenue. It might be that we're paying down risk if we're in a public sector organization. That can be return. It might be that return has to do with learning if we're looking at or applying the pirate metrics to a change program. But let's take this tiny little model and understand it uh, briefly to see where we have been missing a critical fact. It doesn't turn up in any of the, the agile charts about uh, operating expense or burn up or burn down or uh, cumulative flow. And it's a vital piece of the picture. So here we have some numbers for uh, some generic web app. And the idea is that uh, uh, with 100% the top, it's basically saying, that, well, 100% of the people we acquire uh, must start the app. Or, uh, acquire, what we mean is that people who come into our ecosystem. Doesn't mean they're gonna stay. Doesn't mean that we make any money from them. Acquisition simply means that they've done more than, than uh, look at the homepage and, and, and move on to something else. So they've started to engage with um, our ecosystem. Uh, we've, we've talked a little bit about that in the past too. The point is, when they started to engage with it, they haven't necessarily identified themselves. So when they identify themselves by signing up somehow, that's activation. When, when if they come back multiple times uh, to the ecosystem, it doesn't mean that, that, that um, uh, when they came back that we got paid, um, but uh, in principle, we would expect we're going to get paid for the behavior of people who have activated. And so the more that we retain them, the more uh, we are getting paid in principle. Um, referral is then bringing other people in without us having to go to bring them in through whatever acquisition funnel we've got. And then revenue, that's where we make money from. Them. So the idea here is that of the people who we acquire, only 10% go on to um, get a billing subscription in this model. And you can see where people are, are dropping out at different points. So if we didn't acquire so many people, if that was the, the, the key constraint, well, then obviously all of the other numbers would get depressed, as long as we're talking about ratios. Uh, if that's the problem, well, we, we certainly should fix that problem. We should prioritize features that help us acquire people. Features to do with the activation, retention, all the rest of that stuff. Uh, if we're not acquiring them, uh, then, well, and that's what, what our problem is. That's, that's, that's the bottleneck constraint, the key constraint, the one that dominates everything else. We should change our priorities so that that's what we spend our time fixing. But likewise, if, if activation is um, our key constraint, if it's our bottleneck, it doesn't do us any good to be putting a lot of work into acquisition. If most of the people are getting lost, they're not activating. Um, and that goes for all of these. If I, my bottleneck is retention, I would be silly to be prioritizing referral, revenue, acquisition, or activation features, which is to say, if we don't track these things, then we're going to get into big trouble. And we're going to look at a little game at the end of this to try and dramatize that, because the fact is, almost all product owners and product managers are loath to reprioritize on the basis of analytics at least in my experience. How about you, Stefan? Yeah, there are <clears throat> more heroic options, you know, more defensive mm -hmm. stuff, the stuff that brings more applause from the audience within the organization, mm -hmm. the C-level or whoever you're reporting to. But actually, you're supposed mm -hmm. to, to tackle one constraint based on numbers after the other, and you start with the one that's the hardest constraint at the moment, and then you fix mm -hmm. it, and then you 
go on to the next but, one. But let me ask you, how many times have you seen a product owner walk into a room full of stakeholders and say, well, uh, you know, prioritization we, we, we worked on and socialized with you guys. Uh, well, based on analytics, we think it's wrong and we're going to have to figure it out again. How many times well, have you seen that? Not that often. No, I mean, it's, mm. it's, uh, mm. it's putting the, it's the a fraught thing to do. That light. Mm. Yeah. Uh, particularly if, if velocity is going along nicely, uh, product, most product owners are tempted to uh, go, oh, well, you know, it's all rattling along. I'm sure it'll all be well in the end. And they're basically taking their hands off the wheel. So if we, um, if we combine these numbers with the numbers that um, we are used to understanding, we're used to dealing with, uh, then we can see, well, for a start, we can see there is no such thing as a fixed cost per unit of return. This is a cost accounting fallacy. So that means that if we're only looking at the components of operating expense, which is all of the RAG reporting, that's all it's about, uh, then we might be in a terrible situation and not know it. it might, we might think we're rattling along just fine because the velocity looks good even though we haven't sold a sausage. So that's, that's where, that's the stepping off point to move from um, cost accounting to throughput accounting. Does that make sense so far? Yes, it does. Okay. Well, so the, the idea here is um, there's more than one kind of operating expense. Some operating expense is bad. We want to minimize it. Some is good we might want to maximize it. Now that's immediately heresy in the cost accounting books. Maximize his operating expense, you'd be mad, man. Well, let's think about it. We have some truly variable costs, uh, interest rates, electricity costs, various kinds of penalty conditions on contracts, and for that matter, paying interest on technical debt. These are all costs that we would like to minimize, um, and we don't think they're a good thing. But then there's uh, the costs of paying people's salaries to generate net profit. All of the plant, uh, the equipment that goes into to making net profit. If we factor out the truly variable costs, said Coldrack, well then by adding the remaining operating expense plus the net profit, we wind up with a number we want to maximize. Well, maximize operating expense. Even if you factor these things out, that, that what, what on earth would make anyone think that this could give us a good outcome? Uh, are you with me so far, Stefan, or are you trembling at the knees? No, I'm not, I'm not. I didn't think you were. You've, you've heard this stuff before. Okay, so this idea is actually born out on the macro level. If we compare um, Amazon and Barnes and & Noble, uh, in 2014, uh, Barnes and Noble in that year, this is a big bookseller chain in the US. They, their main competitor was Amazon. They had a, a, a net profit that year of about $100 million and operating expense of about $300 million. That doesn't sound too bad. Uh, Amazon, same year, also had a net profit of about $100 million and an operating expense of over 10 billion with a B. Um, pretty obviously you'd rather be Amazon. So the idea of taking the revenue that you are generating and plowing it into operating expense, increasing operating expense to be able to diversify, to be able to look at the edges of your value streams and enlarge them to be able to engage the people that you're not currently serving, the people who are marginal in your ecosystem. Uh, those are all things that are enormously valuable. And to give you an, a, thing, a thought about uh, Amazon, one more thought about Amazon, when they started trying to engage the margins, they didn't look at their retail book business or their retail business at all. They, they moved into offering cloud services to people that they thought were underserved. And these days, 
they make more money from their cloud platform than from their entire retail business. So this idea of maximizing throughput, yes, there'll be some component that's net profit, but, but uh, if we maximize throughput, we are still increasing share price. And that means we're giving the benefit to our shareholders. So there's no particular reason to uh, deliver net profit at the expense of throughput. So I want to dramatize that for a moment. But before I do, Stefan, are you riding okay with this stuff? Oh, totally. Well, I agree with you on Amazon completely. Okay. So here, are, are we, we, we looked at this and went, okay, what, what looks to be problematic uh, if we just look at the operating expense? And we might go, well, that, that blue line underneath there, it looks like our system integration testing is a big problem. Maybe we've got manual testers that might be distributed all around the world, that sort of nonsense. So what we could do is we could automate our testing and we could turf them all out and we could generate more net profit by reducing our operating expense. That's the traditional um, RAG status, cost accounting, top-down PMO view of the world. Um, we make more net profit. Yay! Well, that's completely ignoring the bottleneck that's right in front of our faces on this diagram. Now, Stefan, I imagine that you recall what the, where the bottleneck is. But you tell me, where is the bottleneck curve? Well, I'm looking at the system integration testing now. Maybe, but uh, if we simply look at the return curve, you can see that in just a little while, uh, it's going to meet that operating expense line. And at that point, our entire division or portfolio or value stream, whatever this is, is going to become a cost center, where previously it was a profit center. Probably. So that's, that's that top line, that's really our bottleneck. It's a market bottleneck, like one of the ones we just looked at. And that should be where our concern is. That should be what we're trying to open. But if we uh, reduce our operating expense, we reduce our opportunities to open it. So another way that we can go about this is to um, focus on lifting a pirate constraint. And we're going to need to focus our design capability on doing that. So really, that, that should be the first thing we worry about. We shouldn't be worrying about. Yes, that, that, that curve on down there looks like it's going to go exponential. It's going to go exponential, but right now, uh, well, right before we did that, we were in a situation where we didn't have much runway. Now we have a good amount of time to deal with that thing uh, and many other things. We, we, we're now in a situation where actually our, we, we could spend more operating expense. We could, uh, we could do more with it. But you might go, wait a second, no, no, no. Look, yes, good, you solved your problem. You uh, lifted a pirate constraint and now we can cut the operating expense. Well, Goldratt was asked that question, and, and he said it never makes sense to cut operating expense. It does make sense to improve efficiency. So yes, we're here, we've, we've introduced automated testing, but we've now repurposed our operating expense. We're now focusing more of it on the design and delivery parts of um, the life cycle. And we're, we're, it's costing us just as much. Maybe it should cost us more so that we can increase throughput faster in an Amazon mode. But we're lifting efficiency rather than cutting operating expense. We're not trying to increase net profit. We're trying to increase throughput. And to do that, we need the part of the operating expense that pays for the capability to generate net profit. So far, so good? Good. All right. Well, maybe we can break through the next bottleneck and capture a new market if we do that. Now, it really looks like we're not spending enough. Uh, and, and, but every middle manager in the world is used to the idea that, well, that's crazy talk. Uh, there might be some big executives that want to uh, make decisions about opening new lines of business. We don't get to make those decisions. And that's to say, we are not an agile business. So the kind of stuff we talked about last time about enrolling all of the people who are doing the work 
in sharing the learning and the astonishing return that we saw in SRC that came from doing that. Learning happens all over the place. It happens uh, at, at the operations end. It happens in delivery streams. It happens. And if we don't engage those people uh, and we don't provide reward models that encourage them to share their learnings, to leverage them, to capitalize on them, well, there's nothing, even if the smartest CEO in the world, there's nothing that says that guy is going to get it right. And to pick uh, the obvious example, well, Steve Jobs might have been the smartest CEO in the world, but most of what he did was provide ways for the people who were hired to be able to, f to learn together, to figure things out together, to listen to what they wanted to do, the ideas they had, and to harness those things. Yes, he was a tyrant in many ways, but the main way he was a tyrant was in requiring people to give their very best thinking, their very best learning, their very best efforts to what was going on, rather than trying to make all the decisions for them. So the about opening a new ecosystem, obviously that was uh, Jobs' main focus, but he didn't come up with all those ideas. The people that were involved in Apple came up with those ideas. Jobs simply applied leadership protocols that enabled him to recognize them. So to try and put some teeth in these ideas, we have a little game. And Stefan, I propose to finish this session by, by playing this here bottleneck game, if you'll play it with me. Okay. Okay. So um, the idea is uh, we have got a set of cards that uh, represent the metrics we were talking about before. And each of them is constrained, sharply constrained. Um, so I'm going to play with them. Um, uh, oops. Let's see. Hang on. I have to reshare my screen. Uh, Uh, okay, that's the one I want. Okay, all right. So um, we use this game in our XBA course, but uh, so I'm just going to play it a little bit so that we give an idea. There are a bunch of tricks to it, but we'll keep it simple. So the idea is, I have these. These are an Australian lolly, boiled lolly in a wrapper called a minty. You can use boiled, any kind of boiled lollies you like. The nice thing about using boiled lollies for this is they, they convey, implicitly convey the idea of value. So we're going to try and acquire uh, the, the lollies in this pile, and we want, to, we want to get them all the way through our value stream. So we acquire them, and we activate them. Now, we were only able to acquire one. It's like having a, a, a crimp in our, um, our pipe so that we, um, we can only get one of these lollies through per turn. So we get it through activation, we get it into retention, and we can't get a second one through acquisition. Well, referral is a multiplier on retention. For every person we retain in our ecosystem, we have a certain chance of them giving us a referral of another person. So here we have a times one multiplier. So that's to say, for every lolly we retain, we can create a new one referral. But our constraint on activation is one. We can only get one lolly through per turn. So we're not actually able to make use of the referral. This is an extremely simplified view of a value stream. So this one comes out now. We can through return, we can do one or two things. We can either eat it or we can spend it to, to deliver a new feature that's going to open one of these constraints. Um, pretty obviously, the constraint we're going to want to open is activation. We couldn't make use of the referral. So we can bump that up to two. Now, I should say net profit, if, if we took as net profit, basically, we'd just be eating it. We wouldn't be using it to improve our value stream. So we're immediately stepping into throughput accounting land because we're not trying to eat it immediately. Well, uh, let's plonk it over here to indicate we've used it. All right, so next turn, one of these guys comes in, 
comes into activation, uh, gets to that fine, gets into retention. We have this little signal between retention and referral. We get a times one referral. So now we can get this one into activation. That's great, but, but it can't get into retention. So this is basically telling us the bottleneck has moved. So when we get this one out, we'll go, oh, well, the bottleneck is obviously now in retention. Let's, let's spend it there. We get one more come through, and I encourage everybody at home to play this for themselves and see how it works. It's a very simple game, but it's amazing how the decision-making that's required does not resemble the decision-making that we often have when we're trying to prioritize features or stories in an agile value stream. So this one comes through, just fine, gets into acquisition, gets into activation, gets into retention. Now, we have a referral times one. There's only one in retention even though we could have two or three. So one gets generated by referral, this referral gets activated. It gets retained, but only one of these guys can get through return. We can leave the other one in retention, it's fine, we can retain him. But we still only have one to actually spend. We're only able to grow our business by one, and that sucks. We want to be able to improve our throughput. How are we gonna do that? Well, we could try and increase referrals. But we're still only going to want to be able to get one of these lollies out at a time. So in terms of spending money on features that are going to improve the bottleneck, here the bottleneck has to do with generating return from, um, from the lollies that we have retained. So if we spend this one on features to do with that, I'll put it up here. Uh, now, Finally, I can actually get two Minties out. So I'll, I'll, I'll pull one more through just to see how it works. So uh, we acquire one, it gets to activation just fine, gets into retention. Well, now I actually have two in retention. So I could um, do this. If I go, let's see, one, and, and there, oops, there, and PowerPoint wasn't really meant for playing this game. Okay, so now my referral, each of those is referred to a person. I can't get them through activation. We had, let's see, actually, I'm telling a lie. Sorry, I can get one of them through activation because one of them was retained from the previous term. We only had one go through activation so far. This one can go through activation. We lose it when we're going into retention. Now, these are very, very simplistic ideas about the constraints in our value stream. Real life value streams have many more constraints than these. Nevertheless, at the end of the day, I was able to get two minties out, two lollies out. So what we've just seen is it took us three turns, three goes at the entire value stream to double its output. This is an exponential throughput. Uh, this is an exponential growth experience. Uh, it will always take us three, um, if, we, if we spend our, um, our OPEX wisely, if we spend it on opening the bottleneck constraint, then it will take us three turns to be able to double our throughput. But what if we didn't do that? What if we weren't using this throughput accounting idea? What if we were using lean or cost accounting and just trying to minimize all OPEX? Well, pretty obviously, we wouldn't grow our throughput. Uh, okay, uh, what if we just, what if we just did that for a turn? So uh, we're only gonna starve our value stream for a turn. Um, well, then our competitors are going to get ahead of us and they're gonna stay ahead of us because we can really only afford to put, well, I guess we could borrow something from the bank, but of course that increases our risk. So we're giving a strategic advantage to our competitors one way or the other. Um, so when we start to look at throughput this way, uh, we start to see flow rates that have very little to do with velocity. What if we ignore the analytics? If we ignore the numbers we had on the left-hand side and just pre-allocated a certain budget to every one of our people for every constraint, every turn? 
well, pretty obviously, again, we wouldn't grow as fast as if we spend on the bottleneck, if we reprioritize every turn. What if we have more than one stream? Well, that's where we need to have the stuff we talked about last time. We need to have the remedy of the PMO. We have to have reward models that encourage everybody to figure out what is the most growth we can generate for our portfolio, for our organization. This is the stuff. These kinds of decisions are what's hidden inside RAG status. Without the blue RAG status, which is to say transparent status reporting where we look inside each of our portfolios, each of our value streams, and understand where is the greatest potential to grow throughput. Without that, RAG status is an anti-pattern. And whether we're talking about watermelon programs red on the inside and green on the outside, or whether we are talking about green all the way through, the fact is, this is a shield pattern that prevents us from looking as peers at how to maximize the growth of the top line for our business, whether it's our value stream, our portfolio, or our whole organization. So um, this idea of uh, diagramming throughput over time and understanding things on a basis that is relevant to growing the business. This requires us to share information, the analytics we get per product, per channel, the top line material that the CFO's office has got, and the material we're used to gathering in our agile work management tools, we have to be able to integrate this stuff to look at the patterns, the relationships between these things. To be able to understand how to improve throughput, we have to be able to compare the numbers and figure it out together. Um, and that's blue status reporting. I, have we got any time for questions, Stefan? Oh, absolutely. Cool. Now a question to our audience. Any questions that you have? There is a nice Q&A tool you will find at the bottom menu bar of your window. I'll let you do that part. I'll keep a pretty screen open. Mm -hmm. Okay. No might point. be a good stopping point then. That's that okay. was a lot of input to digest. It was. It was. It was. Um, so, Stefan, any questions on your part? Yes. One. Uh, do you know an organization that is practicing this? So, I know organizations that are practicing parts of it. Um, I did some work with um, ThoughtWorks Australia years ago, and they basically ran open book uh, with their consultants uh, on a monthly basis. It was, it was really stunning to see how well that worked and how important it was to the growth of the organization. Um, but these diagrams, I don't even have a tool that generates these diagrams. The, there is a, a Goldratt Institute that has some tools, but the fact of the matter is the agile ecosystem, as we understand it, only cares about the stuff underneath that um, operating expense line. And even there, we don't relate uh, cumulative flow diagrams to components of operating expense, even though we've got all these tempo style tools that will uh, try and track uh, people's time. The integration of this information and understanding it as a, a, in a data science context, as far as I know, doesn't happen. I don't know if you've ever seen anyone doing any of that. No, no, absolutely not. I mean, uh, <clears throat> most of the time you have to actually track these things by hand. Yeah. Uh, the teams are not yeah. willing to accept the responsibilities to set timestamps <laughs> on issues, but then, yeah. uh, which is really critical from my experience. Yeah. 
I have seen some very good product managers who have done good work in trying to boil the analytics down to decisions uh, above the, the operating expense line, but the integration of those forms of information. And for that matter, um, the ability to relate this to the actual financials of the company, uh, I really haven't seen uh, people doing any decent yeah, link, job. Of that. Linking the information is the problem. I mean, if you, if you, uh, well, anyone should have a, a sales funnel, right? And in, 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 in mm-hmm. analytics and see, okay, where, where, uh, which is the step that is causing what kind of churn, right? Um, yeah. But linking this to actually the company financials is something completely different. Yeah, and it goes to behaviors that are the opposite of agile. So where we have people saying, oh, our organization is agile, but they, they really don't behave that way. As far as they're concerned, agile means in our IT department, we have people who call themselves scrums and uh, I have coaches, I have scrum masters, and those guys are agile and I don't have to be. Um, well, that's, that's really ignoring the fundamentals of the original manifesto, much less the X-scale manifesto, which is all about agile organizations. So um, there is enormous competitive advantage to be had in uh, moving to blue rag status reporting. And I'm aware that if you go Googling for blue rag status, you'll find a few articles over the years people have tried to make blue mean something. But to my money, for my money, this this concept of throughput accounting is the, the, the central important information that a portfolio management function needs to be sharing, needs to make explicit, and not just in its own little office, but for everybody who's involved in the portfolio as a target for their reward mechanisms. So um, uh, uh, the, the, the lack of integration uh, of this stuff, uh, given we're 20 years into the agile revolution, is a little bit appalling. Um, uh, now, the nice thing is, well, okay, it, it took hundreds of thousands of years before humans had the idea that they should put wheels on baggage. Uh, it, it could have happened any time in the last many thousands of years, but right up until the 1970s, people were lugging bags around without wheels on them. So the fact is, We humans are blind to a lot of things. But now uh, I I think it ought to be clear, it's time for us to take a step forward as a culture. And um, we've got this wonderful community of people building business agility as a a set of ideas. Uh, These are the numbers that we need for business agility. So we have to integrate it, Stefan. I fully agree. Cool. Okie dokie. Well, I dare say, yeah, that might be a good stopping point. Oh, next time we have, I think you and I can fit one more of these podcasts into 2018. And I have an idea about what to do in it that actually you haven't been exposed to yet. Awesome. Sounds great. It's, it's, it's the principles of ecosystems thinking, Aww. how they derive from permaculture. That's um, yeah, it's going to be very good fun. It's stuff I've been working on with uh, two uh, uh, coaches in Xscale Alliance, Francis Liu in Sydney and Shingi Kenhu Kamwe in Toronto. Um, and I hope to have both of them on the, the call for this and we can have quite a lot of fun with it, I think. So, um, so that's next time, maybe two weeks from now. Yeah, looking forward to that. Please let me know. Beautiful, Stefan. No worries. Okay. Okay. Thanks a lot for your time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Stefan. Take care.